Hello. All right. Uh, just, just like a regular class. Nobody in the front row. Is that how it works? Okay. All right. Um, start with, how many people enjoy negotiating? How many? Let's see a show, show of hands. Okay. Anybody just kind of like, oh, God, I don't want to negotiate. I hate it. Okay. All right. We have a few of those. All right. Well, hopefully, we'll help those of you who enjoy it. We'll maybe add a few things to your toolbox there. Um, those of you who don't enjoy it, well, we'll, we'll try and make it a little more palatable for you uh, as we go along here. Many times with negotiation, we find that people tend to fall into habits very quickly. Uh, they have a preferred strategy, uh, and usually it's just, you know, well, uh, uh, other analogies. I, uh, I oftentimes would bring my toolbox to class. Like, I didn't feel like schlepping my toolbox all the way over here, but... Um, when I talk about negotiation, I like to talk about it as, as having a set of tools available to you. I mean, we have our preferred tools, one tool that we tend to go to, you know, we fix most things with that tool, but you need to have more tools, right? For most people, when they think about negotiation, the tool that comes to mind is the hammer, right? And they just come out and they kind of beat on each other and whoever's left standing wins, right? Um, the problem is that if all you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. And so you're going to fix a few things. A hammer's an important tool, right? Having leverage in negotiation is very important for us here. But if that's your only tool, you're going to damage a lot of relationships. You're going to miss a lot of opportunities. So we need to have more tools in our toolbox. So we want to think uh, about our, our approaches to negotiation a little more strategically. Right? We want to understand what we're going for. And I'm going to focus today, since we only have a, a short period of time, we're really going to focus on some of the key concepts and applying specifically to entrepreneurship and how these uh, will come out. Um, so I'm going to jump around just a little bit with my slides because I want to focus on a few of the key pieces. Also open though to questions here and we'll make sure we save time at the end for that as well. Uh, always have to start with a definition because that's what we do. Um, Negotiation, the art and science of securing an agreement between two or more interdependent parties that at least partially satisfies their, con um, their conflicting goals. And the Latin for this is uh, neg otium, which, as my understand the translation, is not easy. Um, and negotiation isn't necessarily easy, but it doesn't have to be that difficult. We negotiate all the time. Frequently, we're negotiating without even realizing that we do negotiations. And so what we want to do is raise it to consciousness. We want to think about it. It is an art and a science. We have a lot of good data about what works, what strategies are good strategies uh, for particular situations. But there is an art to it. And that art revolves around communication, primarily listening. So what's the secret to listening? Eye contact's a very good, important one. You all are doing it right now, by the way. Secret to listening? Yeah, shut up. <laughs> the, the problem is we shut up down here, but up here we're thinking, well, when they stop talking, I'm going to say, blah, blah. we're not really listening to what they're saying. And with negotiation, you really need to hear what the other side is saying. But you also have to be able to listen on a, on a higher level, meta, uh, meta level, where you really it's not just what they're saying, how they're saying it matters, and what they're not saying also matters. So you kind of have to be able to, to pay attention to some of the, the surrounding factors that are going on. So a big part of negotiation is in that process, understanding listening on a lot of different levels to really understand what's going on with the other person, okay? So uh, what makes a good deal in negotiations? It varies, obviously, on the situation that you're in. For most people, it should make economic sense, right? It ought to be rational. And in most cases, that's what we focus on. Sometimes that's all we focus on is it a rational deal. But occasionally there's going to be other factors that may be at play that you need to keep in mind. Relationship may be very important, right? If you, you may be willing to sacrifice some economics for continued relationship or for the potential of a future relationship, right? It may be worth it to you to take less if you can get a relationship started with, uh, with this particular person or with this particular group. And so relationship comes into play here as well. Um, and uh, key here for us is we want deals that people can feel good about. And that's what we call stability. All right? 
when people feel good about a deal, they're going to follow through with it. They will stick to the deal. Um, if people don't feel good about a deal, especially afterwards, they have regret, remorse, they're likely to start looking for any opportunity to back out of that deal, to get away from it. And so we want folks, even if you have a contract, we want to just rely on the contract. We want to make sure that people feel good about the deal. And a big part of that is in the, how the deal was communicated, how we arrived at that deal. All right? So it comes back to communication in the, in the negotiation session itself. And when we talk about maximizing efficiency, we want to make sure we capture all the value that's out there potentially. Uh, so there may be other factors besides just the, the, the price and percentages. There may be some other factors that we may be able to bring into the negotiation. So we want to get the best deal possible from that standpoint. Okay. Uh, the way that we want to think about negotiation uh, is from uh, not just our perspective, but understanding the other side's perspective. Most people um, who haven't had much training in negotiation think about things, even if you read books, oftentimes we focus on ourselves, what we want, and we don't think that much about the other side. And the key for us to be successful in negotiating is we have to not only understand our side, our interests, our needs, we also have to understand the other side and look for where can we both get what we want. And that's most of the time we just assume that they want the opposite, so we're just going to have to bang heads until someone says, I give. In this particular case, so we want to think about what are our interests, but also where are their interests, what are their interests, uh, and where might there be some overlap here. And we want to focus on that overlap. Um, the other key piece to this is that we want to think about our priorities. There are typically a lot of issues that we want to deal with. There may be some that are more important than others. And we may be willing to give up on one to get another one. And so what we want to think about is what are our priorities and at the same time think about for the other side, what do you think their priorities are as well? I want to talk about various concepts that you need to consider. In all of them, you have to think not only about what you want, your side of the story, you have to think and put yourself in the position of the other person. Understand what their side is. What do you think their interests are? You won't have a crystal ball, you won't know for sure, but you need to be thinking about where they might be so that you can ask intelligent questions, good questions, that will help you assess that. Why we want to care or think about this is that frequently our priorities are not the same. We assume that they oftentimes are, but they may not be, and we may be able to make some beneficial trades. Okay? And so we'll talk more about this as we go along with thinking about these concepts, but it's important for us to be able to think about these issues, not just from our perspective, you really have to think about it from the other person's perspective as well. Uh, so here's our key concepts that we're going to build around today, and I'm going to talk on these. Um, these are really the, the foundation of, of negotiation. Um, and like I said, a lot of people kind of just get into habits uh, and don't think about these, and so I'm going to try to raise them to consciousness. Uh, and you'll get better outcomes, no matter what you're negotiating. So first is understanding what interests are. We'll look at interests from both perspectives, our perspective, the other person's perspective, the issues that need to be discussed during the negotiation. We'll talk about positions that people take and why you need to be very, very careful about positions and taking positions. Um, we'll talk about aspirations, your goals. We'll talk about bat. Now, this is some new language for you. If you haven't gotten this already, you can use this tonight to Amaze pets and family members, right? Bat now, what's your bat now on that? It's the best alternative to a negotiated agreement. It's essentially, it's what's your plan B? What's your other option? Right, we'll look at that in a moment. And then reservation point. This is your true walk away where it no longer makes sense to do the deal. We'll talk about that. And ZOPA, which is the zone of possible agreements, and we need to be thinking about that. So we'll start with interests and take a look at these. One of the key pieces to this and why we talk about them uh, kind of as a group here, this all revolves around planning, right? A lot of people like to shoot from the hip. They like, you know, go in and fresh uh, without a lot of planning. They usually end up with less than ideal uh, outcomes, and oftentimes they don't even realize what they didn't get because they didn't plan. Planning is critical in negotiations. You have to do a good job planning, not just from your perspective, the other side's perspective. The person who plans better does, this, does a more solid job of planning is going to get a better outcome in almost every case. So it's very important for us to plan for these things 
uh, and, and learn as much about the other side as you can ahead of time. You want to understand what your interests are. This is, what do you want? What is your uh, desire out of this negotiation? Why are you negotiating in the first place? What's the interest that you have in this? All right? And it may be monetary, right? It could be timing, right? Maybe that's more important to you is the timing of when funding will arrive or you know, what levels. Um, it could be uh, access to an investor's network or to their expertise, knowledge, or uh, to some resources that they may have, right? So interest isn't always just about the money. That's usually up there, right? It's, it's, but it's not always even number one. Sometimes people have other issues or other interests that are taking priority even over the money. And if you understand that, you may be able to leverage that, okay? If you can meet the other interests. So critical for us to think about what do we want? It's also not just what we want, but why do we want it? And the same thing for the other side. What do, they, what do we think they want, and why do we think that's very important for them? Right? So it's important for us to do our homework on the other side as much as possible. If you're looking at an investor, try and find out as much as you can about them. What do they look for? What kind of deals do they tend to structure? Right? Uh, you know, look at, at the, what companies do they invest in? How do they tend to invest? Are they people who like to be active in the company? Or do they you know, have a, a, a set group that they will only consider working with? Really try and understand as much as you can about the other side and what approach they would be bringing to the table. Why would they be interested in your business? Right? So part of this, as we come back a little bit later, we'll talk about framing the importance of being able to frame things in a way that the other side will find interesting and want to pursue. But key for us here is to understand not just what our interests are, but make sure you're very clear about these. Uh, understand what the other person's interests are as well. Um, similarly, but they're, but, but they're not the same thing, is issues. Issues are the things we have to talk about in this negotiation. These are the items that we have to cover, whether that is you know, certainly the investment level, how much they're putting in, uh, how, how much of a percentage they're taking out, other factors that may need to be in there, timing might be an issue. These are the issues that we have to talk about. They're certainly related to interests, but sometimes we have interests that supersede or outside of the, of the issues. But primarily what we need to understand is what are the key things we have to talk about in this negotiation? One of the things that we find for a lot of folks, um, and when I teach this class we do exercises of negotiation and really focus and force people to kind of get outside their comfort zone just a little bit. One of the biggest problems that people have oftentimes is how do you start the negotiation? People sit down at the table, they look across the table at the other person and well, you start. No, you start. It's very hard. One of the easiest ways to start, well, we'll actually talk about building rapport, it's very important for us here, but critical is that we can talk about issues without giving away anything. These are the things that we think we need to talk about. Is there anything else that you think we need to cover here? Again, it's a fairly safe way to start, but also making sure you're on the same page. While you think about the issues, you also have to think about what's the most important issue, right? Which issues are critical? Which issues do you have to have a certain outcome on? Which issues could you live without? And then think about it from the other side, because here's where you sometimes identify that there you may have some issues that are really important to you that might not be as important to the other side, right? A good example would be uh, thinking about um, in salary negotiations. Usually signing bonus comes up in there, start dates and some other things like that. Signing bonus is very important to the candidate. For the company, though, it's a one-time payment. Right? So it's less of an issue. Salary, uh, of course, important to both parties, but uh, you know, salary is locking the company into those. So they're much more willing oftentimes to give on a signing bonus because it's less, relatively less important to them, but very important to the candidate. So we look for those issues that where we might be able to do some trade-offs. I'll give up something I don't care so much about in order to get something I do care about. Uh, the technical name for this is log rolling. Right? So I'm giving up on something I don't care about in order to get something I do care about that the other side might not care as much about. But you only get there if you think about these things and do your homework and do your planning. What do you think 
would be their critical issue. Now, occasionally you'll run into people who <laughs> you ask them, well, what's the most important issue for you? They will say, everything. A little more difficult, now you're going to have to help. So of which ones? You know, if your house was on fire, which issue would you save? Uh, you, know, you try to find some way of getting them to prioritize this. But we all have priorities, and you want to kind of suss out what is their highest priority, uh, what might be their lowest priority, and look for opportunities where we can do some beneficial trades. Right? We need to do this for all issues. And here you want to be a little bit creative. You want to think about what else could be brought to the table. It's not just the money, it may not just be the percentage, there may be some other things that we can bring to the table. Right? That adds value, makes a larger pie for us to, to, to divide up. Okay? So, interests, what do you want? Issues, what do we need to talk about? What needs to be settled in the negotiation? Okay? They're related, but not the same thing. What we want to watch out for are positions. All right? Positions are, are things where people will come in and make you know, statements. You know, like, I'll give you blank for blank. Right? Or occasionally you'll run across people who say, this is my first and final offer. <laughs> what do you do with that? I mean, first and final offer, basically it's an ultimatum. You walk away. Now, occasionally they'll go, well, well, wait, where are you going? That was your first and final offer. Well, aren't you going to make a, a counter? Oh, so it's not your final offer. Hmm. Now the situation is, is turning just a bit here. For The key is we want to be very careful about making positions. It's like drawing a line in the sand. If, if, you, if it's a must-have, you know, occasionally you're going to have situations where you, you can't do anything. Your hands are tied. You have to hit this one particular mark. Okay, but be willing to give up on other things probably to get that. So be aware of it. We want to be very careful about locking ourselves into positions. We want to talk about interest. Interests are flexible, right? Positions are not very flexible, okay? So if the other side lays out a position, you want to test it a bit. You want to ask questions about how they got there, but keep coming back to interests, right? By focusing, refocusing it back to interests, you can find ways around that position, around that line in the sand, okay? So, for planning purposes, we really need to think in terms of what is our aspiration. This is our goal. I do this a lot with folks, and, and basically the, the first response usually is, I want to get as much as I can get. All right, sounds good. What is that, right? You need to have a goal. You need to have a specific target that you're shooting for. What are you trying to get? What do you want, right? Because with the goal, you can develop your strategy. Right? You can develop a much clearer strategy because this is the area that I'm going for. This is the level that I want. I'd like to get this much investment. I want to give up only this much of the, of the control in the company. I want to get some other factors. Maybe I want more resources from them. I want access to their network. You know, what are the goals that you're really shooting for here? So again, critical for us to think about our aspiration price or aspiration point, those things that we want, and think about how you can uh, justify asking for those, right? What's your rationale that, that, that uh, supports that? You know, my aspiration is to get a million dollars. That based on, well, I always wanted a million dollars. Hey, that's great for you, but that's not a rational a rationale for why someone should give it to you, right? You need to be ready to provide a good, solid argument. And again, a lot of times folks you know, they, they have an idea of what they want, but they can't really give a good, solid, uh, concrete rationale for why that's a valid ask. And it's really critical for us to do that. By the same token, we have to put ourselves in the other side's shoes and think about from their standpoint. What do we think their aspiration level is? And what do we think is going to be their argument for why they should get what they're asking for? So you have to do this again for both yourself, you have to do it for the other person as well. Right? Think about both sides of this. This is where a lot of people fall down. They just forget to, uh, to do this or they, they, they give it fairly short uh, attention. Uh, the key for us here is you have to be prepared to ask for things. Right? And the, the stronger you, uh, your rationale, the stronger your, your, your ask will be. Right? For a lot of people, um, they're afraid to ask, right? 
or they modify their ask when they get into the negotiation, they kind of forget what they were going for and are only responding to the other side. If they throw out an offer, they get in anchored to that offer. Um, critical for us, believe in your aspiration. That's why you want to have a solid rationale for it. If the other side gives you a, a, a very low offer, maybe they threw out the first offer, you want to come back to your aspiration and say, well, thank you, that's nice, but here's my, here's what I want, and give the rationale. And usually if you have a stronger rationale, you can at least move the bar closer to your side of the table. So really important for us to do this. Again, uh, in my classes, I struggle with my students all the time on this. They usually just come back to, oh, I'll, I want to win as much as possible. Or they look at what's the maximum potential I could get. That's my, ra my aspiration. How are you going to get there? I don't know. So it's not just enough to have a high goal. You want to have a, it needs to be, it can be a stretch, right? You want, you want it to be optimistic, but realistic, right? It has to have some realism in it. And you need to be able to justify it. Otherwise, you throw out a number and the other side can, can shoot it down, right? We really want to make sure uh, that we can support our ask, okay? Um, other thing with this is that with aspirations, oftentimes we have one solution that's our favorite, best solution, and, and that's all we focus on. You want to certainly want to look for your favorite one, but you need to have some, some backups, right? So this is, the, this is my target, what I really would like to have, but I could settle back for some of these others would be just as good, or I would take, you know, they're a strong second or third place. Uh, so don't just get locked into one solution because there's usually multiple ways of solving the problem. Okay, so that's aspiration. Now, that right, best alternative negotiated agreement. This is probably one of the most important terms in negotiation. Uh, it's a critical piece for us. This is a source of power and leverage in a negotiation. Is when you have another option. Okay. When you have another option, you're going to be more confident, right? And it'll, it'll show in how you present yourself to the other side because you have another option that you could take. Think about it with, uh, we'll use employment as, a, as an example. Let's say that you get two job offers that come in at the same time. Now you can play those off each other, right? But what if you only have one job offer? You're not working. You got one job offer. You're looking at student loans or whatever piled up over here. Nothing else on the horizon. How hard are you going to push on that job offer? Yeah, probably not much, right? Thank you, right? Um, the key here is that when we have other options, we can use them as leverage, right? It's our plan B. So if you're buying a car, do you just go to one dealership and look at one car? No, no. You could buy a car anywhere. You don't even have to go to the dealership. You can do it all online. They'll bring the car to you, so it's, it makes it even better. But you want to compare off. You, know, you get an offer from one dealership, you go to the other dealership and say, hey, I got this offer, can you beat it? Right? And you just keep doing that back and forth until you get the car that you want. Right? So the key here is having a BATNA. Now, people will oftentimes try to keep you from doing that. Sometimes they'll put exploding deadlines on it. Right? Say, well, I'll, we'll do this offer, but uh, you, you have till midnight. Uh, Offer, the offer expires at midnight. Um, generally, people are doing that just to force your hand and keep you from trying to develop a bat now, right? Uh, but oftentimes, also, it's, 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 a, it's a ploy, it's a tactic. You have to look at, is it real? Are they really going to forego this deal if, if I don't decide by then? Do I have other options out there that I want to pursue? All right, so don't be afraid to to ignore those if you think you can develop another option, but that's why having those other options really does make a difference. So we always want to try and have multiple sources wherever possible, right? Sometimes situations come up where you don't have them, but this is your best source of power, okay? What you gonna do if you can't make a deal with this other person? Uh, you can walk away and a lot of power. A lot of people won't, don't think you'll do it. They think you're bluffing. Say, well, I've got other options, right? Now, the key here, you want to do whatever you can to improve it, right? And that's why we oftentimes will play off one option over another. Hey, well, I have this over here. Can you meet or beat it? 
You get them to beat it, and now you go back over here and say, well, I got this offer over here. Can you beat it? You go back and forth till somebody says, this, I'm done. I can't do any more. Um, so you want to do whatever you can to improve your BATNA. Uh, and it's not just what your BATNA is. It's the perception the other side has of your BATNA. If they believe that you have other options. If they don't think you have other options, if they think they're the only game in town, which sometimes they are, but Oftentimes, people will think they're the only game in town, or you would much rather do business with me and not with somebody else. They may not believe it, but perception matters. We want to give the impression that we are considering other options. So if you only have that one job offer, you want to give the impression that you're considering many opportunities. They don't need to know if those opportunities involve asking someone if they want fries with that, or if, that's, you know, if it's living under a bridge on Congress Avenue. You're considering a lot of options. Now, here's the key for us, and, and we get asked this a lot. What's the difference between bluffing and, and lying? All right, uh, in negotiations, bluffing is considered, um, you know, it's part of negotiations. Courts have held that bluffing is acceptable under certain circumstances. And the key is, you can't bluff about a material fact. That's fraud, okay? So material facts, got to tell the truth, all right? But if it's about an opinion, in my opinion, the most I would pay or the least I would accept, that's your opinion. You can say whatever you want. But when it comes to BATNA, you don't want to make one of these up. You can allude to the fact that you're considering other options. Again, they could be everything from uh, moving home to you know, living in your car, whatever, okay? You don't have to get into uh, detail on that. Yeah. Yeah, so, so it, comes, it depends on how you do it, right? So let's say you get a job offer and you go into your current boss and you say, hey boss, I just got an offer from Jones and Jones across the street and I wanted to give you the chance to beat it. What are they likely to say? Yeah, so don't let the screen door hit you on the way out, right? It, it comes, nobody likes it, it's like a threat. All right? So you want to be careful from that standpoint about it. The other thing is when you present your specific BATNA, what you get is people going, okay, well, I'll give you just a little bit more here, a little bit there, right? And, and so just kind of get into this nickel and dime uh, situation where you don't make big moves. So you want to give impressions. And a lot of times we can't, deals aren't exactly apples and apples, right? There's always different pieces to a deal, so they don't compare exactly. And so in many cases, you may have some uh, uh, personal preferences that may impact that. Yeah, the valuation looks the same, but I would prefer working with this person. Or I think there might be more future potential. I don't have a valuation on it, but I think there's some future potential here. So I might give that one more weight uh, on that. So it allows you to have that kind of flexibility. What you don't want to do is make up a BATNA. All right, now, this is a story that happened, it's been a number of years now, but we had a student, undergrad, who wanted to get into investment banking and uh, was in New York not getting much traction there, wasn't getting any offers, decided that they would just prime the pump. So they made up an offer, went so far as to create a letterhead from one of the companies, one of the investment banks, and write a letter that, with the specifics of, a, of an offer and presented it to uh, one of the uh, recruiters that they had talked to, saying that, well, I've got this offer with so-and-so over here, but I'd really rather work with you guys. I'd like to see if you beat that. Uh, now, the person who read this realized that oh, that's not exactly how we um, write our offer letters, and we would probably spell check. It wasn't one of our best and brightest, I'm afraid. Um, and um, called the other company, Certainly, they found out that nope, that student uh, was not uh, had not gotten an offer from them, and of course that meant they were blackballed from investment banking. And then they were relieved of their student status here at UT because that's a major infraction of the of the uh, honor code. Right. So uh, the key is that that's fraud creating that. Now proof and things along those lines make it difficult. So you can bluff about your own personal. Um, your, your desires, but you can't 
bluff about the facts. The facts are facts, and so uh, that would be moving into fraud. But you want to give the impression that you are considering a lot of options, that you have other options. You don't want to go in going, uh, I've tried everywhere. You're my last hope. I hope you can do something for me. Sure we can. I'll take 100% and I'll give you this little bit, right? So you, you, don't, you don't want to go hat in hand here. You want to give the impression that you do have other options, that you're considering things. So that gives you the power. It's power and leverage for you. One of the other pieces to this is your true walk away point, which is the reservation price. Now, if you have a bat, if you have another option, that becomes typically our walk away point, right? We've got that. But sometimes you don't have another option, but there is a point at which I'd rather not do a deal at all than take the deal you're offering me. Okay? So we need to know where that point is, where you just say, it's not worth my time. I'm indifferent to doing a deal if it's going to be worse than this particular deal. We need to know what that point is. Right? But we don't want to focus on it. Right? Because if, if, if all you focus on is your reservation point, kind of walk around going, got to get at least, got to get at least, and what do you get? At least, right? So we want to focus on our aspiration price. Know what your reservation point is. Write it down. Put it in your back pocket. When you're uh, ready to sign, before you sign, but when you're ready, pull it out, take a look at it, go, um, yeah, I'm okay. Uh, or, ooh, no, we need to keep working, right? So don't focus on it, but know what it is. Know where it is. Okay, so the other piece to this is never, ever, ever reveal your true reservation point, especially at the end of the negotiation. Sometimes we're so excited about getting a deal, we're shaking hands with them, going, this is great, I thought I was going to have to pay like three times that much. Now the other side says, what? I could have gotten more? Right? Now they're unhappy. Right? So you never reveal that. There's no point in revealing it. People will ask you. What's the most you could pay? Never answer that question. The only answer to that is, what's the least you could take? Right? Never, but people will do it all the time. What's the most you could pay? Well, I, I, this is what I got. Guess what? It's exactly what it costs. Right? So don't reveal those sorts of things. You want to keep that to yourself, but you need to know where it is. Understand that reservation point. It's critical for us here. Let me see. Right. Ooh, okay. I need to speed up. Um, the reservation point is critical for us uh, because that is what sets our zone of possible agreements. Your reservation point and the other side's reservation point. So for yourself, you need to figure all these things out. For the other side, you need to think about what's their BATNA? What's their reservation point? You won't know for sure, but you try to do your homework to give your best guess, right? Because your zone of possible agreements really depends on those reservation points, where your reservation point is and where you think theirs is. If they overlap, like if you can, you're willing to take uh, you know, less than they're willing to pay, now we're overlapping. If the, the least you will take is greater than the most they would pay, now we've got a negative ZOPA. Right? Now just because it's negative doesn't mean we can't do a deal. Uh, it just means we're going to have to get creative because we've got to find a way to bridge that gap. We may find some other things to bring into the deal. Just because it's an overlap doesn't mean we can do a deal. I've seen folks that had a ZOPA that was millions and millions of dollars across, very positive, and they still couldn't do a deal. Mostly those situations, it's personalities that, that get in, in way of those, but it does happen. Um, in fact, I have to talk to one of my students groups of students on an exercise they just did uh, here in just about 45 minutes. Um, they couldn't make a deal and there was $12 million overlap. And couldn't, couldn't come to a deal. So it's <laughs> going to be an interesting discussion here in just a few minutes. Um, so the key for us here, really understand our perspective, what we want, right? Be clear about what it is that you're shooting for, what you want, and your rationale for why you can, why you should get it. Right? You've got to have a good backup reason for this so that when you make your ask, you have that rationale. You can provide that. The stronger your rationale, the more likely you're going to get your end or closer to your end. If it's a weak rationale and they have a stronger one, then there's probably going to be in their court. 
right? So you really need to do your homework, really back up. Um, but as you prepare, keep in mind what we call the 80-20 the, uh, rule. 20% of the time should be focused on you. 20% of your prep time focused on you. 80% on them, finding out as much as you can about them. Right? You want to know uh, their background as much as possible. Look for any connections, because that could be a way of building rapport. And with rapport, you build that liking. People are more likely to keep working with you if things get a little tough in those situations. So you want to find connections that you have with that person. Other things that you need to be looking at is what do you think their interests are? Again, do your homework, find out as much as you can about what kind of investments do they make, right? What's their history? What's their strategy? Are they, are they long-term? Are they short-term? What's, what's their typical exit strategy for them, right? Find out as much as you can so that you, when you craft your offer, your ask, it's based on what you know about them. We need to frame it in a way that makes it easier for them to say yes. Right? So that all comes from your preparation. So 80% focused on them, 20% on you. I got to tell you, most people, it's the other way around. It's, it's about what I want, and they don't really care about the other person. All right? Don't think about it. You know, just give me the money. Okay? So again, uh, key here too, believe in what you're asking for. If you don't believe it, they won't believe it. So that's why you've got to be able to back it up. Um, P4 is then best practices, prepare. Make sure you prepare, understand their perspective, ask more questions. Expert negotiators ask two to three times more questions than novice negotiators do. Novices typically assume a lot, right? Experts ask a lot of questions. And a lot of times they're asking questions they already know the answers to. Find out if the other side going to be telling you the truth, right? How forthcoming are the, is the other side going to be? But also, it tends to make a connection with the other side, right? Especially if you really tend to want to understand their perspective on things, right? And so, again, focusing our message in a way that really matters to the other side and what they're going for, okay? Um, we're getting close on time? Okay, uh, just a couple little things. The opening offer, right? Uh, this is one that's always a, a, an issue for folks, thinking about how do we, how do we make the open offer? Who, who makes that offer? Should you be making it, the one that's asking for things? Or should it be the person that's, uh, that's, that's selling it, right? So this is an age-old question. There's no right answer. Uh, occasionally, usually it depends on your experience. If you've been successful in making that first offer and getting what you wanted, people say, always make the first offer. If your history has been that you make the first offer and it never works out for you, then a lot of times we have people go, never make the first offer. But there's no rule to this. But it really comes down to what you know about the other side. If you have good information and you believe in your numbers, go ahead. You can make that first offer. If you don't, then you want to ask a lot of questions. Don't start throwing numbers around. You want to be very careful. We want to frame the negotiation in a way that is meaningful to the other side. Right? Thinking about it from their perspective. What argument is going to resonate with them? Right? So I want to make sure it's not just about what I want and why I want it, but what's in it for them. Right? That's how you, the biggest source of influence is putting it in the case, what's in it for them. You can also then set your anchor. Right? If you have a strong number and a good justification for it, the negotiation is going to take place more in that area, around that number. If they make a better case, the negotiation is probably going to be stuck around their number. Key for us here is to watch out. If we're too extreme, we make an, an, an opening offer that's so far out there, you run the risk of people going, I'm, I'm not going to deal with you, right? You, we, we have impasse at that point. The other side says, I'm just not going to mess with you, right? And, uh, and you're pretty much done at that point. At the opposite end, if you're too conservative, you run the risk of them going, okay, as soon as you make that first offer, right? And that's when you're going, oh, man, should have asked for more. I should have given more, right? It's the winner's curse, okay? So if you have good information, go ahead and make those offers. If you don't, ask questions. Be careful about making those numbers, making those offers out there, okay? All right. Um, 
let's see here. Again, you, we already talked about most of these things. If you're going to make concessions, uh, be careful about concessions. Oftentimes we have to make a little give in. You want to make small concessions, generally to start with, because we want to see if the other side is going to play a little bit. If I give a little bit, will they give a little bit? Uh, if you make a big move and they don't move at all, you're kind of stuck, because once you make a concession, unless you justify it, you, you really can't take it back. You take it back and then your trust has been broken at that point in time. They're not going to trust you. So when you make a concession, you better be willing to give it, all right? Uh, so make small ones, see if they move. We want that reciprocity. Um, and of course, you don't have to make concessions. There's no rule that says you have to concede. But most people expect that it's going to be there, that it's going to happen there. Uh, key for us, we want to justify it. I will give you x if you will do y. They don't do y, I can take x back off the table. So always make a rationale for it. Don't just say, how about we meet in the middle? This is the primary strategy for a lot of people. Somebody throws out a number up here, somebody throws a number out here, and they go, eh, let's just meet in the middle. That's where we're going to be. Maybe the best outcome, probably not, all right? So don't be too quick to go to the middle, all right? Let's say, I'll give you one last example, and then I'll shut up and let you ask questions. Um, it's the story of two sisters in the orange. Mom, here's a commotion, it's late at night, comes down to the kitchen, two, her daughters, two sisters are arguing over the last orange in the house. Right, too late to go to the store and get any more oranges. What does mom do? Yeah, this is mom's 101. Now, if it's my mom, she would take the orange and the problem is solved. Right? That one, no. Mom's, you know, it's not rocket surgery. You take the knife out, you cut it in half. One takes her half of the orange over to the juicer and juices half an orange, throws the rest away. The other one takes her half of the orange, and this is where I show what I know about the kitchen to the baking center, uh, I don't know, takes the, the rind, the, 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 the zest off, throws the rest of it away. Is this an efficient deal? They'd only talk to each other. They could find out that I want the juice. Well, I want the rind. We could both get what we want. You'd be surprised how many times there are issues where we can both get what we want if we'll talk to each other. But most of the time, we make these assumptions and we don't check it, okay? All right. So. Uh, in our few minutes that we have left here. Uh, questions? Did anybody? Have? Yeah, okay. <laughs> well, it's in, in everything we talked about. What do we think their aspiration is that they want? Try to understand as much as possible what their strategy tends to be. What is their, how do they typically approach things? Um, try to think about where they're, um, uh, historically, you know, what kind of deals have they made? All right, so I want to find out what's their, what's their history there. Um, and find out as much as I can so that I can build some rapport with them. I want to be able to connect, look for any kind of connections that we had. Maybe we worked at the same place. Maybe we had, uh, grew up in the same areas. We want to find some personal connections because we can build on those. No, you don't have to play it like that. But you want to make sure, because they, they may only have a couple of aspirations and like you have to make up aspirations for them. The 80% of the time is you want to focus a significant amount of time like any of the rules that we have here, it's not an absolute, but you want to spend the majority of your time, the vast majority of your time, thinking about the other side, not just about you. Okay. Uh, let me go back here. He had his hand up first. Yeah. Well, right, you can, you can ignore it, for one thing, and say, well, you know, here's what I'm looking for, right, and take it back to your aspiration and, and lay that out there, right? Because it, it's a, it's a, Question, but it's it's a question people will ask and sometimes people will answer, but you never want to respond to it. You just you can laugh it off, but it kind of depends on the relationship that you have established there. And you can say rather than focus on that, I'd rather focus on what we really need to get out of this, right? Uh, and and just redirect it to your aspiration. That you want to keep focused on that. Yeah, as a college student, well, make sure you know the lay of the land, what you have to offer there, right? Most people only think about the the the, the money that they're going to get and how much they're giving up in terms of control things. There may be other factors. Like I said, oftentimes, you know, they, they also provide resources, uh, connections, entries, uh, uh, networks. Think about all the value that, that could be there, plus other things that you might be able to bring to them. It may be limited there, uh, but you've got to be a little bit creative in your, in your thoughts on that, right? 
just don't get hung up on just the money. I mean, that's always a big part of it and, and control, but there may be other factors that you can play in here. Maybe able to give up or you know, gain more control or give up less control by getting something other that you might have. Other questions? <laughs> okay, yes. I think if you've, you do this a lot, then you, you kind of know what you're looking for in those. I think that, um, again, customize it based on what you know about the other person. Uh, if you're a large enough company, you can have your standard term sheet, right? Um, but uh, you know, have, based on your homework, you can make that first off if you're, if you're very solid and uh, comfortable with those. Um, again, sometimes some, some groups have, have preferences about the way they approach that, but I, it's no problem having it ready and, and, and especially how you present it. If you present it as, well, this is our term sheet, feel free to sign it, right? And that's it, right? It's just like it's non-negotiable. And that's one of the things, never ever ask someone if something is negotiable, right? Because you're open to the door for them to say, no, right? Just assume that it is and start negotiating. And they'll tell you if it's not, right? And then if they don't want to negotiate that, well, then work on the edges, right? We just keep working that around. Somebody had to handle it. Yes, I'm, I'll get everybody here. Go ahead. Right. In an application form, yes. There's not much you can do except put your best guess number in there. That's why doing your homework, what should this job pay? Right, and put that number in there, um, and sometimes they'll ask for ranges. You know, you want to make it a small range at the upper end of your real range, right? Because they're going to choose the lower one. But you always want to talk about it as a package. You, you could be a great salary, um, but it all depends on the other benefits. Or you know, it could be a lousy salary uh, if you don't get anything else. So we always have to look at things as a package. If they want to nail down an issue before moving on, you can say, I think we're in the ballpark. Let's look at the rest of it. But I, have, I couldn't possibly agree till I see the whole package. Right? And if they won't play that way, there's something that's not right. Okay? There's no reason other than they're trying to take advantage of you that they would not want to go look at it as a package. It's in their best interest, too. Those all kind of go into play with that. Again, what I really caution people about is don't go in just throwing numbers out, right? Because that's oftentimes what a lot of people do. They just immediately throw a number out. Um, you need to know the lay of the land. You need to talk to people. You need to build rapport. Right? If you're doing cross-cultural negotiations, if you, there's some groups that if you have an established rapport, you're not going to talk about anything of substance. It could take several visits uh, before you get into, into to still depth on things. So you really have to build rapport there. So you want to know more about the other side. You just want to be careful about just starting off with numbers, unless you really have good, solid, uh, do these same deals over and over again, and you know this is where it really has to be. This is the only way we can do it. OK, be, be solid with that. Yeah. It doesn't have to be a hard transition. Go, OK, now we're good, right? Because in the US, about how much time do you think we spend building rapport? Yeah, about 30 seconds to a minute and a half. You know, once we get past the weather and the sports, what about that game last night, right? Then it's, all right, let's get down to business. It doesn't, you don't have to make that, that sharp turn. In a lot of cases, you know, as you're building rapport, you're also sharing a little bit of information. You're getting a little bit of information. Negotiation is starting. The dance starts right at the beginning uh, rather than saying, okay, let's get down to negotiating. In fact, I think probably one of the best negotiations I had was where we did, it was just a discussion. By the time we were done, you know, the deal was basically there. And we just wrote it up and signed it. And the person said, wow, I'm so happy. I thought we were going to have to negotiate this. Doing the whole time. You just, it didn't have to be give and take. Uh, in fact, a lot of times, if you stay on opposite sides of the table, especially if there's any kind of dispute, that's very adversarial, right? I want to move. I'd like to be at least 90 degrees to them. Ultimately, I'd like to be on the same side of the table with them. I want the problem up on the board or the offer, the issue up on the board. So it's you and me working against that, how we're going to fix this, right? Use it as a problem-solving approach. You get a much better outcome that way. It's hard. Sometimes you can't get there to start with, but uh, ultimately you want, to, you want to build that rapport. Yeah. Rapport is, is building a, a connection with the other person. We have, we build a rapport. Uh, we, we know a little bit about each other. The more we know about each other, the more comfortable we are. It goes to uh, one of the uh, influence tactics of liking. 
like somebody, you'll keep working with them. If you decide you don't like them or you don't have, feel like a connection with them, you hit a rough spot, you kind of go, yeah, you know, we tried. So it's, well, not related just to business. We build rapport and friendships. It's, it's, a, it's a human. Okay. Well, first off, I have to look at, is it in, is it in the ballpark that I can work with or not? Um, and then I'll probe to see how firm that is. Uh, sometimes people will draw lines in the sand to protect themselves against something else, right? That's not the real reason why they're, they're being stuck. Uh, it, it's maybe uh, the, what they're showing us, not really what's going on. So I want to probe behind that. I want to look at other offers. I want to ask a lot of questions. I may need to take a break. Uh, go back, do a little bit more homework, but really try to understand. You know, I, I, I guess I'm curious, why can't we move past this price? It just seems, seems like an arb awfully arbitrary price. What's that based on? Right? I want to probe a little bit deeper behind that. And not just to destroy that, but maybe find out what's the real issue here. They, maybe they can't say yes. Maybe there's some other factor that's going on. Maybe they're not the right person to be talking to. They can't make that decision. Or it could be all sorts of things that may be uh, going on. Don't just assume, well, that's the limit and we can't go past it. Try and probe around it. Look for other ways uh, to, to solve that problem and get around it. Okay, we're good? Oops, it's my time. I've got to go teach another class. So um, thank you very much. I enjoyed it and uh, hope you all have a good day. Mm -hmm. Thank you.